I pray that you'd bless now and try to open your word and speak to us from Scripture. In thy name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, if you'll turn the book of Ruth with me tonight, please. Ruth is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Ruth. Okay, now chapter number one and verse number one. The scripture says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. They came into the country of Moab, continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left, and her two sons. They took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Father, bless your word now. In thy name I pray, the holy word of God. Amen. There's a lot of things said about the book of Ruth. And Ruth. Some see it as, as uh, have said that it is the greatest piece of literature ever written on the face of this earth. I won't argue with them at all. But it's studied tonight in a biblical sense. And that is, that where does the book of Ruth fit? Well, if you notice the book right before it is the book of Judges. And the Bible characterizes the book of Judges as a time when every man did that what was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel. That's important. Because the writer of the book of Ruth is making a connection between the book of Moses, the books of Moses, the first five, and the first king. Well, the second king, the Davidic king. He's making a connection. He's showing you how that even in the darkness, and Judges is one of the darkest times in Israel's history, even in the midst of all that darkness, the hand of God was still working. And that's important to understand that. They had gone from the house of bread, Bethlehem, that's what it means in Hebrew, house of bread. And they'd gone to God's wash pot, which is Moab. And these were accursed people. And it appears that Naomi uh, received some of that curse while she was there. But there's a great truth to be learned here in the book of Ruth. And uh, the greatest of all is Ruth herself. This book is named after a Moabitess. It's named after a pagan who chose to become a daughter of Israel. No king, no king. And so the first king of Israel was who? Saul, 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 son of Kish. And then the second king of Israel was uh, David, David, the beloved one his son of Jesse, and he was anointed as the king by Samuel, whose mother was Hannah, and she asked for him. So therefore, we have a transition from the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, into the first king of Israel, which gets us into 1 Samuel. The Bible tells us that 1 Samuel was a prophet, and he was also a judge. And of all the judges that Israel had, Samuel was by far and away, head and shoulders, above all the rest of them. Ruth is not called a judge. Her story comes to us because she is the great grandmother of David. So the genealogy stands out here. It's very important why the writer is writing the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth has great, great understanding for us today. In the book of Ruth, you'll find the sovereignty of God and the will of man, human will, she had to make a decision, she had to choose, but God Almighty, who knoweth the end in the beginning, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, it may appear like there's no way it can happen, no way it can work. How in the world is this going to work out? Yet the hand of God never fails. That's what's important. He never fails. And if you watch it and run and see the theme as it goes through the scripture, you'll see what I'm talking about. God is in complete control in the book of Ruth. He knew that Ruth would accept the God's 
of the God, rather, of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel and reject her gods. Uh, two of them are Shemash and Moloch. And if you know anything about the Bible, you know that Moloch was the one that had his arms out like this and they put their little children, their little live children in his arms, sacrificing to this monster and it rolled down into, his, into, his, uh, into, a, into a cavernous area uh, full of fire like a furnace. And they say they would beat the drums, beat the drums to cover up the sound of the little children as they screamed. You don't get any lower than that. You don't get any lower than that. That's as low as it goes. And so the children were offered up. It's quite a remarkable thing too. And you think about what I'm about to say to you. Ruth came out away from that. She came from that. She came from the darkness that she was born into in what little light she saw in Naomi. And uh, Naomi had made a choice that told her to go back to her gods, just like she did Orpah. Go back to your gods. Yet Ruth chose, no, I'm not going to go back. I'm going to take your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now compare her to Solomon. Solomon brought Moloch into Israel. Yeah, he did. Solomon brought child sacrifice right into the country. So whose sin was the greatest? Well, his sin was by far and away greater than anything Ruth had ever done because Solomon uh, sinned against anointing. He sinned against the light. He sinned against the truth and the privileged position that he'd been given. And because of his sin, Israel suffered greatly. It was because of Solomon that they wound up at his death. The country was split in two. Ten tribes to the north and two to the south. David was the only man that Israel ever had as a king who was able to unite all 12 tribes together. And he did. And he, he did. And he was anointed as the king of Israel more than one time. So the book of Ruth is a book that prepares us for the genealogy of Christ with Ruth the grandmother. And that's something. That's something. She did, probably didn't know a whole lot about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But she knew this. She'd take any God over the one she had. Amen. Amen. And I'd say that to any person out here in the world. You know, you've got a God. You say, I'm not religious. Yes, you do. You've got a God. The Bible says Satan's the God of this world. Every man to his bone is religious. I don't care who he is. I don't, you can call yourself an atheist all you want to. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't uh, become an atheist because of science. You, become an, you became an atheist because of your heart, what you think you're mad at God, or you can't understand why there's suffering in the world. That's why you became an atheist. And so your issue with God is, it has nothing to do with, with science. Your issue with God has to do with, with your perception, your mind, you know, how you see things. Now, when this happened out here in Uvalde, Texas, I tell you what, folks, that's done something to me. And I'm going to tell you one of the worst things about all of it was this, that this monster walked into that classroom and he began to kill these children in front of children. Can you imagine the terror that went through their little hearts? I can't imagine that. I don't know of anything worse on the face of this earth than that. Somebody should have told him and all around him, you're going to hell, son. That's where people like you go. He blew himself into hell when he committed suicide. Or no, he didn't. He didn't commit suicide. Wait, huh? In a sense, he did by going in there. But no, he was, he was killed by law enforcement. And uh, rightfully so. Don't you believe in forgiveness, preacher? Oh, I certainly do. I believe Christ bore his sin along with my sin and all the rest of them. But he also says plainly, fear him that hath power to destroy both soul and body in hell. It also says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. And you don't hear much hell preached today and you're getting the benefit of it. You don't hear much. It's all about feel good, prosperity, all that garbage. That's all people hear anymore. They think that's Christianity. But in any event, what, you, what you've witnessed in the last few days, in my 75 years on this earth, folks, I don't know of anything worse. It's, oh, it's, it, it just, it, it turns my stomach at the cowardice of this monster to walk in there and murder those little helpless children. Oh, boy. You see, he never thought for a minute that when he died, he'd go to hell. But all murderers need to take, a, take note. When you die, you're going to hell. I don't care what your religion is. If you're a murderer, you're going to hell. It's that simple. And that's exactly where he is. So she left that country. She left Moab. 
and she came to a different country called the land of Israel. And it was her hap, the Bible says, hap is an old English word, it has to do with, we get our word happy, in other words, her, 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 uh, her, her, I don't know what the good word for it is, it just happens, <laughs> hap, that she was there, that it was her place. And what was it? It was the field of Boaz. And Boaz may very well have been the richest man in the whole country, or in the, at least in the area. He was rich. He was. It was quite a remarkable uh, happens, happens, uh, happening, isn't it, for her to come to the... And not only that, but he was a kinsman redeemer. That's quite a thing. Hebrew word is goel. Goel has Elohim on it, and it means one who redeems, one who buys back from poverty, one who lifts up from the dunghill, one who's able to reach into your circumstances and change them, take you out of it. There's two, th and here's the thing that's so important about redemption, folks. This is so important. An unsaved man will spend all of his time changing his environment and his surroundings. A saved man doesn't spend all of his time changing his environment and his surroundings. He lets God reach in there and pull him out. God didn't change Egypt when he took the children of Israel out. And this world is getting worse by the day. This is why I'll come for his bride. Come on, my dear one, rise up and come away and he'll come and catch her up to meet him in the clouds. So Boaz was a kinsman redeemer and she went. And she went by the instruction of Naomi who had tried to get her to go back to her God, she wouldn't do it. Naomi means blessed or comforted. Uh, God has blessed Naomi. And, and when she came back to her people at Bethlehem, they saw that she was a widow and they saw they lost her sons and all of that. And, 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 and they, you know, they felt very terribly for her and said, Naomi, we can't. And Naomi said to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for God has been bitter with me. Mara means bitterness. And he's been bitter with me. I've paid dearly for my trip down to Moab. But you see, my dear friend, even though she paid dearly for it, she brought a prize back. She brought a jewel back. She brought a pearl back. Now, here's one of the greatest lessons you'll ever learn in life. Find that pearl. Note that jewel. Because the Bible says these precious things, the pearls and jewels, wind up in the snout of a swine. Like a pearl in the snout of a swine. If you don't know what's precious, it's like a pig. You don't want the pearl. You go for the slop. That's what motivates them out here. They don't want a pearl. They don't know what the pearl is. They don't have any idea. They go for the slop. They go for what they can smell, what they can taste. I've been told by hog farmers, I never farmed hogs before, but they, tell, they say that if you raise a, raise a hog, feed him grain and feed him, you know, the good things like that, well, he'll do just fine and he can grow and fatten up. But they say that if you give him slop, if you give him slop, and then try to take him back to the grain, he won't go back. Once he gets into the slop, that's where he wants to stay. And do you know, folks, most people live their lives like hogs. Their head's down in the trough, and they're eating the slop. They never bother to look up. They don't ever bother to look around. They're just as blind as they can be. So what makes you think they're blind? The Bible said the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. That's the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. The image of God should shine into them. So we have something going on here that's a beautiful thing because that's what I want to get into now. Naomi instructed Ruth to go to the threshing floor of this man that had been giving her grain and handfuls on purpose. Go to the threshing floor. And in those days, the threshing floor was a place where grain could be found because they were, they were grinding out the chaff from the, from the grain. And they would stay with it until they took it all up and harvested because somebody would come by and steal. So you mean to tell me somebody would steal back then? Oh yeah, they had thieves then, just like we got thieves now. Thieves have always been with us. And so they stayed out there in the field with their grain. You see, he was protecting it. Now, the threshing floor was threshed in the daytime, but the Bible says that he winnowed at night. You notice it. She said, he's winnowing. Well, what's the difference between threshing and winnowing? Well, threshing produces the chaff and makes it available, and the winnowing is when you take it and lift it up, and the wind carries it away. You see, the wind is a type of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God does the work of salvation, folks. 
Amen. He separates the chaff from the wheat. It's the Holy Spirit, the wind of God that blows. And uh, so what happens here is that she goes, but she has something in mind that she's instructed to do while Boaz is asleep. She gets at his feet and covers herself with his, uh, with his cloak. And, uh, and when she does this, she does it to say something for that generation then that they completely and fully understood. She was casting herself at his feet for his protection. It was all about what Boaz could do to protect her, not so much, as, not so much in feeding her. He was already doing that. He was already doing that. It was the protection. Now, Ruth is a type of the church. And the church. Boaz is a type of Christ. And uh, so the bride of Christ here is going unto the feet, and they're covering themselves, and a metaphor for this cloak would be wings. They're covering themselves with a wing. And the Lord said to Jerusalem, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thee together as a hen gathereth her chicks, and you would not. You see? Now, I don't know much about raising chickens, just like I don't know much about raising hogs. But I have seen mama chicken and all her little baby chickens come running toward her. That's what I've heard. They do that. They run toward her for safety. And with her wings, she'll cover them. I've heard quite a few stories like that where, uh, where, where, where one would protect the other with its wing to keep, the, uh, to keep the enemy out. And so what she was doing was saying, I'm putting myself at your, at, your, at your mercy. And if I am protected, I'll be protected by you. And so we say today that we put ourselves at the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're protected, we'll be protected by him. Here, notice carefully. He'll never unprotect you. <laughs> you belong to him, you'll always belong to him. That'll never change. That'll never change. So we won't get too much in, deep in, in, in depth into what's going on here, but he said uh, he would be, do the part of a kinsman redeemer, but there's a, a kinsman closer than him. So he went to the gate of the city, and he sat down at the gate of the city, and he called ten men of the city. And the legal business was done at the gate, See, at the gate. That's where it, because if you don't come and you don't go except through that gate, that meant that it was public. It was there. Everybody could see it. And so the kinsman that was the closest to her, closer to her than Boaz was, came by. And Boaz said, Ho, such an one, called out to him, and come over and sit here while I tell you what's going on. And so he offered him the uh, place of kinsman redeemer and said, With it, you have the property. Of, uh, of, uh, of, of her uh, former of her husband and, uh, and, and by doing that uh, you've, you've, done, you've raised up uh, the seed in Israel and uh, you've, you've done what, your, your part and, and Boaz was very smart about it because the nearest of kin said I'll do it I'll buy the land I'll take it and I'll play the part of kinsman redeemer Boaz says but the day you do that you've also got to take Ruth to wife the Moabitess She's called a Moabitess five times in the book of Ruth. Now, when God says something five times, he wants you to think about it. She's called Ruth the Moabitess, the Moabitess, the Moabitess. He said, I can't do that. He said, if I do that, I'll mar mine own uh, inheritance. And that gets off into a different thing because there's a lot of controversy about who he was and what his inheritance was, a lot. You wouldn't believe. Some say he's representative of Israel. And by bringing a foreigner in like that, that he couldn't uh, inherit, uh, uh, you know, legally and morally uh, what, he, what, he, what he should have had. And others say, well, it's simply because she was a Moabitess that, that the man physically would not have anything to do with her. She was a curse and all of this, and on and on and on it goes. Sometimes the answers aren't easy. But the bottom line is that whichever one was closest, some say he represents the law, the law, the law of Moses, see, because the law of Moses showed up before the grace of God did. And so he represented the law of Moses. And the law of Moses could not receive anybody. They couldn't receive anybody. They couldn't save a soul. They never saved anybody. Did you know that? Nobody was ever saved, ever has been, or ever will be saved by the law. You can't do it. It has no power to save. 
The only power the law has is, as Paul said in the book of Galatians, he said this about the law. He said it was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Pedagogue is the word there. We get podiatry here in this English language. A pedagogue, a teacher of children. And it means he's saying that a child being raised in a home with another child of the same age, they both sit in the same classroom, they both go through the, go through the same instruction, and they both grow at the same rate and at the, at the same time. And until that child is grown to a certain point, why well, he has an inheritance and he has a blessing that's all his, but he never gets it till he gets big enough, till he grows to that point where he can receive it. And the other child, too bad for him because he's not the inheritance. And so he said, the law of God was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Well, in the sense that they grew up and it came, but also in the sense that a man that has any wisdom whatsoever, he'll know that you cannot be saved by the law, that it takes the grace of God to save you. Why, preacher? Why? I mean, what if I just kept all the law? Well, you can do that. I never met anybody yet. Can you do that? I can't. Man, it smites me like you wouldn't believe. I start reading the law, it wears me out. I say, woe is me. As Isaiah said in chapter number six, for I'm unclean, a man of unclean th lips. Woe is me. And the seraphim came, came with the coals to uh, purge him. Oh, no, no. If you're honest tonight, if you're honest, you'll say, oh, I got my problems. I've got my problems. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm not perfect. And so how are you going to get to heaven? The only way you'll get to heaven is through one who can take you to heaven. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only one. So she lies down at his feet. Now, there's two threshing floors in the Bible I want to call your attention to tonight, two of them. This threshing floor is a place of judgment and separation. That's what takes place at the threshing floor. floor. Judgment and separation. You separate the chaff from the wheat, right? But you're grinding, you know. Grinding in the Bible is a type of judgment. Samson ground. You remember he was grinding around and around. A threshing floor, therefore, becomes a type of a place of judgment and separation. And so what happens here is that she lies down protected under the feet of Boaz, her Savior. See, her Savior. Isn't that quite an ironic thing? That murdering dog out there, his name was Salvador Ramos. Do you know what Salvador means in Spanish? Savior. El Salvador, South America, the Savior. And his name is Salvador Ramos. But she lay at his feet, covered, and oh, even though the, the, the grinding and the winnowing and all of that was taking place, she was perfectly, perfectly safe because she was at the feet covered by the wing of the Lord Jesus Christ type in Boaz. There's another threshing floor in the Bible, and there are many of them, but this is another one I call your attention to tonight because it's a very important place, and it's called Moriah. There was a man there, his name was Onan, or uh, there's another name for him, or, uh, what is it, Aruba? Uh, what is it? Aroma, yeah. Uh, the Jebusite. He was a Jebusite. And it was the threshing floor, Aruna, the threshing floor of Aruna, that's his name, the Jebusite. Well, he's called Onan in another, in another place. But you see, this threshing floor is at Moriah. Now, the word Moriah in Hebrew means where God sees and God will be seen. A lot of Hebrew words are like that. They have double meanings, triple meanings. It just depends on the application. So, at Moriah, there's a threshing floor, and there's a rune of the Jebusite. And David, a type of Christ, buys that threshing floor from Aruna. And on that threshing floor, are you, are you following me now? You know what's going to happen? When the Lord Jesus Christ is nailed on a cross, he's nailed on a cross at the top of Moriah. Moriah. You see, Moriah is a place of judgment. And it's also a place of separation. It was at Moriah that the sinners are separated those that are protected under the wing of the Lord Jesus Christ and those that aren't. 
Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift because I've been accepted, protected under the skirt of Boaz, just like we all have tonight, if you know him. Now, I've told you before about Moriah. It's a little, it's odd. When 1900 B.C., when Abraham took Isaac to Moriah, it was all one, one hill. And it was well known at the time. Melchizedek was from Moriah. And so he took Isaac to the top of Moriah, and there he offered him as a burnt sacrifice to God. In Abraham's mind, it was done deal, but God intervened. He sent a ram up the other side, and so his son didn't die. But they say that when they began to build a temple, the temple that God told them, he, did ever, he said, when did I ever tell you to build a house for me to dwell in? And they built a temple. They needed stone for it. Now they got their wood from Lebanon, and they brought down through the, through the Mediterranean, and then it was pulled up on land, and right to this day, you can find the spot where that wood that was pulled in to build that temple was pulled up on shore. It's there. You can see it where it was brought in. All right, that's the wood. But where did they get the stone? Well, they got the stone from a quarry, but they started quarrying at Moriah. They started digging at Moriah, cut the stone out. This is why Calvary is a place on top of stone. This is why, as General Charles Gordon, uh, in the early 1900s, he looked across and he saw what looked like a skull. All right? The skull is rock. Now, that skull wasn't there in Abraham's time. But when they dug down in there to build the temple of the Lord, the digging process left this hideous looking thing where the stone had once been. In plainer words, to build the temple created Golgotha. Now think about that, to build it. See how it works? See how it goes? And when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified on what was Moriah. But at that time, 2,000 years ago, it had been cut out and all you had there was the face of a skull. Golgotha. So he died. So a threshing floor is a very important place. It's a place that will grind the chaff from the wheat, then the wind will blow it away. You ever notice that, folks? You ever notice how there's some folks scared to death of the Holy Ghost? Well, then why aren't you scared to death 24-7? Because if you're supposed to have the Holy Spirit in you. Why should you have one, one waking moment that you're not shaking in your boots? You see, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. Right? In plain words, if you do not have the Holy Ghost, then you're not saved. You're not born again. And don't run to the book of Acts where they said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Paul says, I have, you haven't even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. He said, what are you baptized to? He said, the baptism of John, John the Baptist. That's a transition period, a transition from that age into the grace that we're in today. So it's very important to understand tonight that I don't have to tell you if you have the Holy Spirit. How many of you in here not need to tell me you're alive? Raise your hand. How many of you here know you're breathing? You don't need me to tell you you're breathing. <laughs> right? You're alive. Right? Do I need to tell you you're alive? Well, that preacher doesn't believe I'm alive. No, it doesn't make any difference what I believe. If you're alive, you're alive, right? Well, in 1973, the Holy Ghost moved into my soul. And it doesn't make any difference to me what all the religious world says or does. It's not going to change that one bit. And that's not arrogance talking. That's absolute assurance. Nothing so profound could happen to somebody and, it, and they not know it. I don't need somebody to tell me that I have the Holy Ghost. Either you do or you don't. Well, say, preacher, how do I know you, know, you don't? Okay. Okay. You don't. Well, how do I get the Holy Ghost? Just get saved. You call on the name of the Lord. God will save your soul. And when he saves your soul, he'll do something for you. Now remember, Ruth was a Moabitess, and she came out of paganism. And because of that, she became the great-grandmother of David. And David's the king. 
Oh, I know Saul was the king, but he wasn't the king. David is the king of Israel. He's the one that you don't ever hear a Jew talking about Saul the king. They're always talking about David the king. In uh, Matthew chapter number one, the generations of David. See, David's the king. So we have now reached into the darkest moment of Israel's history, and God now has pulled out from a pagan land the great grandmother of David the king, and she's, and she's Ruth the Moabitess. Her life could not have been better. Her choice was good. She made a good choice, made a good choice. But let me show you what it is when you make a choice like that. First of all, if you take refuge under his wings, you're sealed. He hath sealed me with the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. What day of redemption? To the redemption of the purchased possession, the body. He's coming to give me a new body. But right now, I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. The sealing is to protect me. The sealing is to identify me. Sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. There again, if I have to tell you you have the Holy Ghost, don't believe you have. You ought to know it. There's nobody as big a God as God that could move into your soul and you not know it. Amen. 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 Just think about when you got married. That woman you married moved into the house and, and you wouldn't need doubt in your mind you had somebody at home there with you, did you? <laughs> That's the way it is with God. When he moves into your soul, you know it. So I'm sealed. But I'm also seated together. The Bible said I'm seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So how could that be, preacher? Because we do not know the essence of a spirit. Okay? We do not know that. And the essence of a spirit is the essence of life. And the body without the soul is dead. Am I right? See, you're shaking your head. What should it say? As the body without the what? Spirit is dead. Not soul. The spirit. All right? And we don't know the essence of a spirit. We don't, in other words, by that, can a spirit be much larger than what we than, than this flesh? Sure, it can. We don't know. Can, is there something about the spirit that can be present in heaven and here on earth at the same time? Yeah. The Bible said we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not future now, yeah. right? My flesh is not, and my soul is not. But we don't know that spirit. And that's the essence of life. Third thing is I am accepted in the beloved. Isn't that good? There ain't a one of us that wants to knock on the door of heaven and say, St. Pete, move out of the way. I'm here. Well, who are you? <laughs> Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> that's what those demons said to the seven sons of Sceva. They, they were professional exorcists. Well, I showed up in heaven now. Let's, let's get started. no. If you don't show up in Christ, you won't show up, period. Amen. He's the only one that can bring humanity into the presence of God, yeah. except in the beloved. Number four, I am written in heaven. Don't rejoice because demons are subject to you, but rejoice because what? Your name is written in heaven. Amen. Amen. Written in heaven. And then finally, I'm a son of God by the new birth. Yes. That's why I call him Father, Abba. Abba, Father, Father, Father. As a child says, Abba, Ab is another form of it. Father. We call him Father. He said, when you pray, pray thusly, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The fatherhood of God runs from Genesis through the book of Revelation, but it's different in the Old Testament. God the Father is more or less a, as a figurehead to the Old Testament saints. Uh, he, 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 they're their sons and his daughters in that sense, yes, because of a, of a covenant relationship, but not because of a being, not because of their being. We today acknowledge him as our father because I am his son. I was born of him. I was spiritually born of God. That which is born of God, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of God, what? I have been born by the Holy Spirit of God. I am a son of God tonight. And I thank God for that. That can't change. Nothing can change that. All the devils in hell can't change that. Well, you see, Ruth chose all that. She might not have known it, but it's not necessary to know it. God knew it. And he brought her out. Now, 
Let me say this, folks, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll shut up. I've got some real heroes in the Bible. I think that uh, Hadassah, you know, they call her, is, they call her uh, Esther, which is Ishtar. Hadassah means myrtle. She's a hero because she was willing to offer her life for her people. She said, maybe it was for such an hour as this. Yes. Moses. Moses stands high, high, high with me. And because he, he, he chose the affliction of God's people, he, he chose that when he was refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses. Moses. Abraham. I hold Abraham in great, great, great respect. Why? Because Abraham left the same kind of thing that Ruth left. He left heathen darkness. He left it. And all he had was God's promise and a little light. And the further Abraham went, the more light he got. Amen. The further we went, the more light he got. And that's the way it is with a Christian life. I have great respect, folks, for Abraham, believe me. And I have great respect for Paul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, who more than likely wrote 14 books of the New Testament. I have great respect for him. These are men that I, that, that, uh, and women that I, I exalt, I lift up. I have respect them. I respect their life, who they were. They're my heroes. You know, I'm going to tell you the truth. And uh, there's so many others in there that I have respect for, too. I mean, Joshua, for example. Look at them. Look at all. There's so many in there. Take the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and you'll look at the, they call it the hall of faith, and you'll find so many names in there that are wonderful. But you know what? I, we, got, we got heroes today movie stars and musicians and, and Lord, Lord knows whatever else. I'm going to tell you the truth. If they asked me who such and such was and they'd give me a million, million dollars, if I could tell you who such and such was, I'd walk away. I wouldn't get the million dollars because I don't know who they are. I am so detached from what people scream and yell and laugh and jump up and down and get carried away with today as their heroes. They're not mine. I don't even know them. I don't even know them. I don't keep up with it. If I watch anything, I watch that old stuff 50 years ago. <laughs> old boring stuff, you know, 60 years ago. Black and white. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the good stuff. Well, you, you watch some of that black and white, I guarantee there's some things you will not see and you will not hear. You can count on it. I'll tell you, uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I started to say something else, but my, I, I grabbed my tongue and said, no, 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 you're not going to do that. <laughs> And like Saul said, I forced myself <laughs> when he came back to Samuel. <laughs> I forced myself, he said, Lord have mercy, help us. <laughs> and uh, Samuel said, what meaneth the bleeding of these sheep? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, God bless the memory of Ruth. Yes. Amen. We'll meet her one day. We'll meet this Moabitess, great-grandmother of David the king. We'll meet Ruth. We'll meet Esther. Hadassah, we'll meet her. We'll meet Moses. Man, Abraham, boy, can't imagine. Can't imagine. Now, of course, I left the Lord Jesus Christ out of all, the re all of the rest of them. Why? Because I don't hold him in high esteem. I worship him. <laughs> why, did, why'd you put, why didn't you put his name with the rest? For the same reason that the Holy Ghost said when Peter said, let's build a tabernacle here for Moses and one for Christ and one for this and that. He said, if this is my beloved son, hear him. There's going to be one tabernacle on top of that mountain to Christ. I don't compare him to anybody or anything. He is infinitely, eminently above everything there is. There is none as high as the Son of God. Father, bless your word. Time we have together with my brothers and sisters to exalt the precious name, the precious name, the precious name, hallelujah to God, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his holy name I pray, amen. amen. Folks, pray, pray, please pray, pray, pray for these poor old souls out there in Texas. Yes. Those mothers and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles and family members that have lost these little children.